Hello everybody, this is Basim who's joined the graph and you're watching the second video of this Janus Graph installation series where I show you how to install and configure Janus Graph and its storage backends on a Linux Ubuntu server. In this second video, I'm going to show you how to configure Janus Graph to use Oracle Berkeley DB Java Edition as its storage backend. But before we start on the configuration, I want to first talk a little bit about uh, Oracle Berkeley DB and what it is. Berkeley DB is a key value um, database library. And it's actually, it's an embedded database library. Embedded here means that it will be loaded into the Janus Graph uh, process and will be executed in the same process as Janus Graph. And this is different from other storage backend options like Cassandra and HBase, for example. Cassandra and HBase are standalone database servers. Like they run into their own process and they listen to a certain port. And Janus Graph communicates with these database servers over the port. But um, Berkeley DB is a much more lightweight uh, storage backend option. It's just a library, a Java library that comes as a jar file. And Janus Graph references this jar file and it calls the library API to actually read and write data to the database. And let me show you where this jar file is for Berkeley DB. Right now I'm in the Janus Graph root folder. So I'll go to the lib folder on the Janus Graph root folder and I'll list this folder contents. And you see the Berkeley DB jar file, it's this um, jar file right here that starts with JE. And this came with the Janus Graph package that we downloaded in the previous video. So you don't need to download and install Berkeley DB separately. If you have Janus Graph, you already have the Berkeley DB library. So now let me clear the screen. And what I would like to do next is start making the necessary changes to the configuration to make Janus Graph use Berkeley DB. Right now I'm in the live folder, so I'll go one level up to be in the Janus Graph root folder. And we know from the previous video that all the configuration files are under the conf folder. So I'll go to that and I'll list the content. And actually we need to go into this folder, gremlin-server. So right now I'm in the, under the Janus Graph root folder and then conf and then gremlin-server. Let's list this folder contents. And by default, the Gremlin server will use this configuration file, gremlin-server.yaml. So if you don't specify any other configuration file, this is the one that will be used by default. So we will be editing this file, but before we do so, um, I'd like to make a backup of this file. Just in case I mess up, I'll have a good file to go back to. And I'll call the copy, the backup copy, gremlin-server-backup.yaml. Okay, perfect. So now I'll open this gremlin-server.yaml for editing. And this is the contents of the YAML file. The most important line is that one right here. It sets graph to this path, conf slash Janus graph dash in memory dot properties. So this YAML configuration file is referencing another configuration file, this dot properties file. So this YAML file is like our entry point for the configuration and can reference other configuration files. Let's take a look at this file, see what it, what it contains. So I'll open another terminal window. And I'll go to the Janus Graph root folder, and then I'll go to the conf folder. So this um, Janus Graph dash in memory configuration file, it's under the conf folder directly. And that's the one that's used by this YAML file right now. So let's open this file, see its contents. And this is the most important line right here. It sets storage.backend to in-memory. So this instructs Janus Graph to use the in-memory storage backend. And we did um, try that in the previous video. We ran the 
Janus Graph Server with the in-memory storage backend, and it did work. We were able to run some Gremlin commands. But the problem was that when we restart the database server, all the data is lost, right? Because it's only saved in memory. So once you shut down the server, once you end the server process, all the data is gone. And when you restart the server after that, it just, um, you find that you have an empty graph. So we want to do something different this time. We want um, a storage backend that actually saves and persists the data to the disk. And we will use Oracle Berkeley DB for that. So we will not be using this, um, this genesgraph memory properties file. Instead, we'll use one of these other properties files. Let's look at the names just to try to understand the convention. It says um, genesgraph Berkeley Java Edition es. So Berkeley Java Edition, this is the storage backend that will be used to save the graph data. And ES for Elasticsearch, this is the mixed index backend. And this other file is called Berkeley Java Edition for storage, and then Lucene for the mixed index backend. This one is Berkeley Java Edition and Solar for the mixed index backend. This one is Cassandra and Elasticsearch, Cassandra and Solar. Cassandra without a mixed index backend. Okay, so for this video, the one I'll use is, we want to use this one, Janus Graph dash Berkeley Java Edition dash Lucene dash Properties. So we will use Berkeley for the, for the storage backend and Lucene for the mixed index backend. So I'll edit this YAML file. And again, because it's a little bit confusing, this YAML file is like the configuration entry point and it references this property file, this properties file right here. So we will edit this YAML file to point to another properties file. And I'll write this and quit. Okay, so we just edited the YAML file. Let's take a look at this uh, properties file that we're about to use. And you see it sets the storage backend. It used to be set to end memory in the previous properties file, but this time it will be set to Berkeley Java Edition. <clears throat> so Berkeley will be our storage backend. And it sets storage.directory to this path. So this is the path where Berkeley DB will be will store the, the files, the database files. And this path actually will not work for me. Because you remember from the previous video, <clears throat> I created a user um, specifically to run Janus Graph. I call this user Janus. And I only give this user the permissions that are needed by Janus Graph and not more. So this Janus user that's, um, that's used to run Janus Graph, it doesn't have right access outside the Janus Graph root folder. So it will not be able to write to this path. It can only write to the Janus Graph root folder. And um, let me clarify this path right here. All the paths in these properties files are relative to the Janus Graph root folder. So here it will go one level, these two dots, it will go one level above the Janus Graph root folder. And then we'll create this DB folder as a sibling of the Janus Graph root folder. And then we'll create a Berkeley folder under this DB folder. And the Berkeley DB data files will go under this Berkeley folder. And again, this is outside the Janus Graph root folder. So um, the Janus user that we're using to run Janus Graph does not have the permission to write to this path. So it won't be able to write to this path. So what I need to do is I need to edit this file and replace the two dots by only one dot. The one dot will represent the Janus Graph root folder. And this DB folder and the Berkeley folder will go under the Janus Graph root folder. And the Janus Graph should be, sorry, the Janus user should be able to write to this path without problems. Let's keep scrolling through this properties file. It says that the index.search.backend Lucene. So it will use Lucene as the mixed index backend. And finally, it sets index.search.directory to 
this path. And again, this path is relative to the genus graph root folder, so it will go one level up and create a DB folder and create a search index folder under it. Again, will not work for us because the user that's used to run genus graph does not have write permission outside the genus graph root folder. So we need to modify this path. I'll replace the two dots by only one dot. So now this, uh, this path is out, is um, under the genus graph root folder. And these were the only edits I needed to make to this properties file. So I'll write this and quit. And now we made all the changes that we need to the configuration files. Let's now run the server. Let me clear that. <clears throat> and before I run the server, um, you see right now I'm logged in as the root. I don't like running the server as the root. That's too much permissions for Genus Graph or for any um, for any other server software. So what I do, I create a user specifically for running this server. In this case, I call the user Genus. So I'll switch to this user Genus. And I will use, first let me navigate two levels up. Now we're in the Genus Graph root folder. So from here, I'll go to bin. And let's list this folder content. Um, and then I'll run this shell script that starts the Gremlin server. And this should start the Gremlin server for us. And we just started the Gremlin server and it's now listening to port 8182. Perfect. So now I want to test, um, you know, sending some Gremlin commands to this server. So I want to run the Gremlin console from this other terminal. Um, again, let me switch to the Genesis user. And then I'll go two level, or just one level up. And then I will go into the bin folder. And I will run this gremlin.sh, which will start the gremlin console. We just started the gremlin console. So now let's connect it to the server. I'll say remote connect. Um, tinkerbot.server and then the path to the configuration file will be conf slash remote.yaml. We just connected it to the Gremlin server, but like we said in the previous video, <clears throat> this is, um, this just connects it to the server, but doesn't automatically send the commands to the server. If you want to send the command to the server, you need to proceed it with a colon and a greater than. And anything that comes after that will be sent to the server. And if we don't want to remember to put this colon and greater than in front of every command, then we can say remote console. This will send all the next commands to the server automatically without having to proceed them with a colon and a greater than. Okay, so, and again, like we said in the previous video, the server defines the graph object for us and the G object, the graph traversal source. So these variables are already recognized by the server and we can just use them. And it's interesting, you know, we can look at the string representation of this graph object. It says it uses Berkeley Java edition as the storage backend. And the data files will be written to this path. That's great. This is exactly how we configured it. So we can see here that our configuration is being used. That's perfect. So now let me let's let's check the graph, see if it's um, if it has any data to start with. G.v.count. And we see that there are no vertices at initially. So let's add a couple of vertices. Let's say g.add. V, right, and the vertex label will be person. And I'll create a property on this per vertex and property name will be name, right, and the property value, we can name this person P1. So I executed that and created the vertex with this ID. So let's create another vertex, another person, and the other person's name will be P2. So we just created the second vertex. Now let's count the vertices. 
now the count is two. So we have two vertices um, in our graph right now. Now the big question is, if we restart the server, will these vertices that we just created, will they be remembered? Because the last time they were not remembered. The last time when we shut down the server and started again, we, we found an empty graph because it was using the in-memory storage backend, which doesn't persist the data. So restarting the server just wipes out the data. Um, this should not happen this time because we're using Berkeley DB as our storage backend, which does persist the data to disk. So we should be able to shut down the server. I just switched to the terminal that we used to start the server. Now I'll do control C on my keyboard. This will shut down the server. And then I will start the server again. So the server was started successfully, is listening to this port. And now from the Gremlin console, I can just keep writing commands. Now, since we restarted the server, I'll have to close the connection and then reconnect the console to the Gremlin server. So first I'll say remote close. This will close the connection with the server. And then um, we'll find the remote connect. Remote connect, again, we connect to the server and we want to send all the coming commands to the server automatically without having to precede them with colon and greater than. So I'd say remote console. Okay, and now the big question is, if we say g.v.count, will it remember the two vertices that we added before restarting the server? And yes, it did remember them. We still have two um, vertices in the database, despite restarting the database server. So that's great. It's working as expected. And one thing I'd like to show at this point, I'd like to show the um, files on the file system where this data is being stored, because we specified the path for these, where these files should be stored. So let's take a look at these files. Um, So let's go to the genus. This is the genus graph root folder. And let's list the folder content. And remember, we said it will be stored in a DB folder under the genus graph root folder. So perfect, we can see the folder DB. So let's navigate to DB and list its content. And it has two folders. The Berkeley folder, where the, um, Berkeley DB will save its data. And we have a search index folder where Lucene will save um, the mixed index uh, data in this folder. So let's go to Berkeley and list its contents. So these are the different files. We don't really have to understand these files. They are just files that are created and managed by Berkeley DB. And this is the most important one. It's not even human readable, so there's really nothing to see here. Just know that this is where your data is being stored. This is where your graph data is being stored by Berkeley DB. And we can take a look at the other folder, the search index folder, and list its content. There is absolutely nothing in it because we did not create any mixed indexes in our graph. So this one is empty right now, but if you do create mixed indexes, Lucene will save them in this under this folder. So I showed you how to configure Genus Graph to use Berkeley DB as its storage backend. And now the question is, is it a good idea to use Berkeley DB? And I hate to say that the answer is probably no. And I'll explain why a little bit later. Um, at the beginning, I thought that Berkeley DB is a good option for when your database is small enough to fit in one machine. Because if you do need to partition your database across multiple machines, then for sure, Berkeley DB is not for you. You need to use a different database that does support partitioning, like Cassandra or HBase. But I thought that maybe Berkeley DB is a good option for when your database is small enough to fit in one machine. It's for sure the most lightweight option because it's just a library that's loaded into the Genus Graph process. So it's just API calls within the same process to read and write data, as opposed to having to pass messages to a different process if you're using um, a database server. So it is lightweight and it also has an amazing license. It's licensed under Apache 
which is a very permissive license. So no issues with the license. But my issue with Berkeley DB is it looks like that software, it's currently owned by uh, Oracle, but I don't know if Oracle cares about it very much. It's, it's supposedly an open source software. And yes, you can download the source code from the Oracle website, but I could not find any public repository for it. And it's not on GitHub. Um, so I don't know. I just, I wasn't very confident about it. And I, I was able to find the message board, but it's a very inactive message board. So I don't know if anybody is using this database and if it will, if it's currently supported or if it will be supported for a long time in the future. It doesn't look like it's future proof at all. And that's why I'm very hesitant to use it in the production application. Um, but I'll do some performance tests and if it ends up to be so much faster that than Cassandra and HBase for this particular use case where the database is small enough and you don't need horizontal scalability, if it turns out to be so much faster than the other storage backend options, then maybe I'll use it in production. I hope that I will not have to. But yeah, that was it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching and please stay tuned because in the future, I'll make other videos about how to use other storage backends. We will install Cassandra and HBase on this Linux server and we will configure Genesis Graph to use them. So please stay tuned and thank you so much and goodbye for now.